welcome to the latest episode of the Locker Room podcast with myself, Kevin Marr. So I'm delighted to say I have Rob Castley on board today. Uh, Rob is a strength and conditioning coach in rugby at the moment, but has also got uh, experience in GA camogie, football and hurling as well. Uh, Rob, how are you? Good, good. Playing it. I have to obviously ask everyone how is COVID treating you? Yeah, it's not too bad. I'm probably getting more training than now than I've ever done in my life, which is great. Um, obviously, evenings being freed up. Um, I suppose not being with teams as much as you normally would be or taking it online or whatever. Uh, yeah, definitely frees up a lot more time for your own kind of individual stuff, which is probably putting the back burner for a little bit too long. I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm finding that exactly the same. I think there's a, a bit of a, I guess, a silver lining that a bit of self-care can go on now for the likes of ourselves who have you know four or five different jobs so it's not the worst but how are you finding all the have you had many uh zoom workouts or anything like that uh no i managed to to avoid them <laughs> possibly good um sticking to like the online programs and stuff um like uh, for the first lockdown i went and bought a spin bike straight away i was like i have to get ahead of the curve if, mm. if i could and then I'm just after buying um, a squat rack with 200 kilos of weight, so that'll keep me going for the next 10 years. Or so. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, look, I, I know you're you're working in an awful lot of positions, and you have done as well. So uh, maybe if you don't mind, just giving us a, a bit of a background on yourself, your education, your work history. Yeah, so um, I did my undergrad in IT Tralee. Um, studying health and leisure and um, so the lectures that we would have had back then who were massive into the SNC side of things would have been the likes of Pat Flanagan uh, who have a massive background in Irish athletics work with Special Olympics and he would have had a stint with the stint with the Kerry Senior footballers when they were really starting to kick on and then um, towards the latter end of my time in Tralee we would have had Joe O'Connor um, he'd be the owner of Nice Fitness I'm not too sure if you know it um, so he would have uh, won multiple All Irelands with Clare Hurling, uh, Limerick Hurling. I think he had a stint with Kerry Footballers as well. So got a fairly good grounding in it um, in in IT Tralee at the time, um, and then that kind of sparked off the interest. Really, I suppose uh, once I finished in Tralee, I went and did a master's degree in UL straight away. Um, so once I finished there. I got an internship with Connacht um, stayed there for maybe six months. Um, and then as soon as I left Connacht, I got a position with the boarding school in Ross Gray, the Cessertion College. Um, and then everyone's kind of snowballed effect into where I am today as well. Very good. Yeah, and you're involved obviously with, um, with Ross Gray, Young Munster at the moment as well. Um, and also with the Irish two clubs, and I know you've worked with Tipperary as well before. So um, I think we actually did the same masters in in UL. Now that I'm thinking of it, the sports performance one, which is yeah, very good. Um, my first question, then, if we sort of dip into your your early days and the internship, maybe, and your your work with Tipperary, then moving into to rugby. So how did you find all of that? Um, the internship was really, really interesting. Um, like being involved in that kind of environment every single day, it's like it's the reason you went to college to study it. It's the reason you invested five, six years of your life to to get there. Um, a lot of people go into college and they they might not have that drive to become an SSC coach to work in professional sport or whatever, or like all the different streams that they could actually go into. Um. So yeah, look, it was great to actually get it, get your foot in the door and to coach some unbelievable athletes. Uh, long, really, really long days. That's probably <laughs> the one thing I remember most from uh, from Connacht. Um, I wasn't commuting up and down. I was actually renting up there at the time, and even like you're you're in there for six a.m. and you're not getting home until six seven in the evening. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, you're literally prepping meals for the next day for lunch, um, eating it in the gym and going home go to bed and just repeat 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 um no it was tough those internships are really tough going um i was doing an unpaid one at the time even though i had my master's degree this is maybe seven years ago now with this red um so as soon as i ran out of money that was it game over you have to go home and pretty much start again from square one really 
Um, so once I finished up at Connacht, um, the actual director of, of sport in the Sturgeon College is from the same town as I am. Um, I would have known him overly well at the time. He would have been the, the local GAA manager. Um, and he heard that I was involved with Connacht. Um, and then he just got in touch with me, asking me, did I want to to come in as SSC coach for the for the senior cup team in Ross Gray? Oh, excellent. Yeah, very good. And your your time in Ross Gray, have you, obviously it's a, a big rugby school and everything. So did you have, you know, sort of a good basis to work with? Were you building stuff from scratch? How was it? Um, my first year there was actually the year we won the senior cup. Um, and we didn't even have a squat rack. We had a rack of dumbbells, some real old gym matting, and you just had to get really, really creative for how you actually roll programs and how to progressively overload and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was not, really, it was nothing fancy. It was just get in, a bit of hard work, a bit of grunt, and I suppose, like, it's probably what Ross Gray is known for the most. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, we we're, were really lucky that year. We had some unbelievable athletes come through the program. Um so my first year we would have reached the final, won it. And then the next year with pretty much the same group, a lot of them were fifth years. Uh, we reached the final again, except we lost. Pretty sure it was the same team. I think it was about there. So yeah, it was a replay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's, that's very cool. And like, I guess, how do you, how, what would your opinion be on how they were successful then if they didn't actually have any sort of formal strength conditioning work? Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to put a figure or a number on it because at the time there was no KPIs. There was very little. We had, we did do video analysis, but on the S&C side, there was no real structure put into it. Um, and I suppose when they're at that stage in the in their program where they're fifth to six years, as soon as they look at a dumbbell, they'll probably get massive gains straight away. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, to be honest, it was probably one of the easier jobs that I took on at the time because no matter what you did, nearly everything worked with them. Yeah. Um, like now when I go into the boarding school now I think I'm there about six or seven years now and things are way different to what it was at the beginning now we we walk in the gym instead of that one squat rack or sorry instead of that I think it was a smith machine at the very back of the gym and it was just a wall of dumbbells now it's literally just a wall of wall mounted squat racks and way more dumbbells way more equipment a couple of spin bikes looks like a different place there's more it's kind of art along the wall and it looks like a facility that you'd actually want to train in versus the one where you kind of get handed down the whole way through and if i had a tough whoever was doing the junior cup at the time must have added a lot <laughs> and what kind of impact do you think all of that equipment now has made so like without obviously giving away any state secrets you know uh, what, what kind of impact has it made yeah, look, they're obviously a lot more robust and they're obviously way stronger than what they previously were. Um, Osprey is kind of normally built around a massive pack. Um, we're just brutes, to be honest. Um, <laughs> not much has changed there. They're still probably a foot taller than I am, maybe 30, 40 <laughs> kilos ever, which would be hard. But um, no, we've got a really good pathway now in the school. Um, there's a junior cup um, SNC coach in there now. Uh, I would have handpicked him from LIT in Perlis. Um, he's been doing excellent work he's been doing basically you go in you tell him when they get to uh, TY I want them to be able to do X, Y and Z and he'll he'll work it out and any athlete that I've got from so far is they've been unbelievable excellent very good and obviously then you're you're involved with Young Munster as well so that kind of it's, it's very interesting that you're involved in sort of school age and also then you know senior and again you're involved with the, the RFU clubs team as well so you're kind of getting your hands on, you know, people around 14, 15 years of age and then seeing them all the way up through. So yeah. how are you finding uh, Young Munster at the moment as well? Yeah, Young Munster's, it's a brilliant club to be involved in, to be honest. Um, I don't really know what you could, <laughs> what you could say about them. Nearly, I'm there so long now. I'm there three seasons going on four. Um, they're nearly like mates now at this rate. It's kind of hard to give them a bollocking when they, when they don't put the to work in but I know they're they're a phenomenal bunch to train there's some really good athletes in there as well like 1A is a it's a ridiculously high standard of rugby and a ridiculously high standard of athlete as well um, like the majority of those lads have either been through a professional setup and got let go at some stage so their training age is obviously phenomenal like it's you're probably looking at more of the fancy stuff um, in training where it's like 
you could probably program cleans, power cleans, hand cleans, um, and they fly to it mm -hmm. uh, because their training age is so good. Whereas probably in the school, we focus more on like med ball work for power, um, jump in, sprint mechanics, sprint tech. Whereas with young monsters, it's more like let's load the bar up, let's let's look at um, moving the bar fast, that kind of stuff. Mm. Oh, cool. And what kind of impact then would you have, I guess, around the, the RFU clubs team? And obviously, you know, a very successful team based on last season. So um, what does that look like for you and uh, what kind of role do you have there? Um, yeah, it's a real interesting one. Um, basically, our, our head coach in Young Munsters got named the, the head coach for the Irish club side. Uh, and he rang me straight away, asked me, would I be interested? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> um, so to be honest, it was a very, very little work involved. Um, like you're literally going up to camp. The hard work was nearly done. The hard part I'd imagine would have been looking through all the video footage of all the players, which Gar and Mark Hamilton, who'd be involved with Terran York, team manager, uh, and Blaines, who was the head coach of Black Rock, formerly of Terran York as well. Um, that would be the hard part going through all the squads going through all the recommendations uh, recommended players uh, and then narrowing down your squad to maybe 40 players who get the chance to train I think we had four camps um, yeah I think we had four camps and then two games home and away against Scotland and that was it really uh, on the work side of things <clears throat> hardest part is probably getting everything in together so like at the time I was working a nine to five job, still am working a nine to five job. Um, boarding school in Ross Gray on a Monday, pitch session with the cookies Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, a match with the cookies on a Saturday, and then you're commuting up to Dublin for a training camp and high performance center on a Sunday. Um, so yeah, like to be honest, that was the hard part was finding the time around it and actually having the energy because when you go work with these lads, like who've, as I said previously, they might have been coming through the the provincial setups or something like that they expect a decent standard and like their training age is so good and they've seen so many coaches you simply just can't bullshit your way through it you need to be prepared and you need to have the work done essentially um so that was one thing that i definitely thought i tried to bring to the side anyway where it's no matter what you do no matter what involvement you have you're prepared for when you go there mm. um so just for my work inside there is kind of making sure they're on top of their recovery because obviously they would have played on the Saturday and then we're getting to train again on the Sunday. Not ideal, as you can imagine, but <laughs> yeah, like bodies were sore. Yeah. Um, lads weren't too cranky actually, which was very surprising. Like. Um, but yeah, no, bodies were sore and then trying to motivate them to get the move and it's kind of, it wasn't tough going, but like you, you feel for them, you know, kind of like it's a real hectic, heavy week. Training sessions weren't, they weren't overly taxing, but they, like they could be long because Obviously, it's a new team, yeah. new country, uh, new plays. Forbes had to work on Scrum Tech. The day after an AIL match was obviously pretty shit. Um, and line outs and stuff as well. A lot of lift and a lot of walkthroughs as well. But no, on the taxing side, sessions were probably maybe a four or five RP session length might have been up to an hour and a half at times. Yeah. Um, but no, it was brilliant. Brilliant experience. Probably two of the best working months I put down in a very long time oh excellent excellent and obviously then you've worked as well in sort of GA and Camogie um I know you were with Tipperary there for a while and, and helped a lot out with um the academy system so to go from one sport to the other how did you find the work with with Tip uh yeah it was it was kind of similar to working in the board school obviously it's a very similar age group so I would have taken the under 12s under 14s, 15s, 16s, and 17s. Um, they would have got a 45-minute gym slot. Um, there they would have got like an introduction to foam rolling, uh, general mobility, sprint tech, resistance training, and then send them on their way. Um, we would have had a really good system in place, to be fair. I think the first year we did it, there was something like 23 uh, hurlers and footballers involved in the program to begin with. Um, and that's going from under 12s all the way up to they're under 17s and then I think my last year doing it there was 150 in total wow, yeah. so it, it did take off pretty well um, it was a good system for the simple fact that it was based in the LIT Perlis campus with the sports lab LIT sports lab it's where Santa College run their uh, workshops and stuff 
state of the art facility is probably worth a couple of million. Uh, so like you literally have any toy, any sports science equipment that you ever possibly dreamed of, it's there for you. Um, so we used an awful lot of testing. Probably the main difference between the GA and uh, rugby, they're so into their testing in comparison to rugby iPhone. Uh, and obviously like their training age would be completely different to that of a rugby player the same age. Um, like you're going in and you're, you're teaching them how to do just a body weight push up, and they're really struggling. So, like real simple basic adaptations and progressions for every single exercise is probably the most important thing. Whereas on the rugby side of things, if you told them to bang out ten reps of ten quality body weight push ups, they do it in their sleep. Um, so what we would have done was for every age group, it would have been myself um, and one other person, one other SNC coach, and we would have basically. Um, wrote out the program for how we wanted it to run. So we would have ran a four week block of just, um, just an AA phase, basically mm-hmm. uh, real lightweight, uh, high reps, just trying to get them to move better. And then we would have screened them. So this, the testing that we would have done would have been for height, weight, uh, limb length. Um, Cause one of the lectures in LIT was studying peak height velocity for his PhD. So we, we threw it in for that as well. Um, so that would have been that the anthropometric stuff sorted. Then we would have done um, overhead squat, pretty much all the FMS tests there was. Yeah. And, um, we would have done a CMJ test, a 10, 30 meter sprint test and a yo-yo intermittent test. And I think it was um, a chin-up test as well. So like there's a good bank of data there for them to, to see where they're at. Uh, we would have done reports on it and stuff like that to see where they were in comparison to everyone else, their age group. Um, so then once we got the test results back, what we would have done was we would have ran a traffic light system. So if you scored a zero or a one in your overhead squat, you'd be putting a red group, a red, um, a red for a squat might look something like uh, heels elevated with uh, a mini band around your knees. An orange might look like... Um, a goblet squat, a green might look like a front squat. And then we would have done like a blue and gold for like the Tipperary colors, uh, which might be something like a back squat. Mm -hmm. So we would have done that for every single exercise movement there was. So your squat, your push, your pull, your hinge, your jump, your single leg work, um, everything. Everything would be color coded. The the kids would know, or the athletes, whatever whatever way you want to see it is, they know what group that they're meant to go into. Um, and that they're getting the right dose of whatever exercise that they need at the time. So if you go in, your squat is good. You might be a green, but your upper body might be weak. So you might be a red on that. So they're getting a decent stimulus put into them for what they need at the time. And you're kind of trying to promote what they're good at. And it's nearly like an injustice not to, not to load them on whatever they can be good at nearly, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Like let them do what, what they're able to do. And that's, yeah, that, that's, very interesting. So basically you're, you're going after sort of those base level strength components and making sure that they can control their body weight first and foremost before we do anything else. And like what, um, we noticed, what we noticed the most was that uh, we tested every eight weeks. So okay. we take their height and their body weight. You'd see massive jumps because they're obviously going through puberty at the time. Um, like some kids were we're going, growing a couple of centimeters in the week, in the six to eight week block, and they're going like, where the hell? <laughs> then you notice that their coordination would start going crazy. Um, any balance work we did, any single leg stuff, they might find very difficult. Um, and then you, you know, because you just look at your numbers and you, you peg it straight away. Um, it was good as well at Tipperary Academy because we took a lot of students in from LIT as well. Yeah. Um, so like you're nearly trying to bring them in get them their first kind of bit of coaching in as well, giving them feedback, letting them run sessions. And then for a finish, I was nearly just trying to overview and plan and run everything and let them do all the coaching on it. Yeah. And how did you find, uh, I guess, the the, the buy-in from the players and from parents, say, for example, at that age, or even coaches? Um, Because I think we, we love data as sort of sports scientists, strength and conditioning coaches, and it doesn't necessarily transfer over to, to coaches, depending obviously on who you're dealing with. But did you, did you find that was quite good, the, the buy-in from those? Um, 
I I didn't think it was a problem when we were doing it. Um, for the simple fact that um, Damien Young, I don't know if you've come across him. He, no, yeah. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal lecture. Mad into the GAA. I've never seen anything like in my life. Um, he he would have been like the director of the program, we'll say. He was the one who was actually doing his PhD on the peak high velocity and, and elite athletes in GA. Um, he would have ran a lot of information and stuff um, on the Friday evening when the gym sessions were taking place. He would have brought all the parents in. He would have given them an um, introduction to weights, why they're doing it, the benefits. Um, basically just educating the parents because at the end of the day, it's teachers – and it's coaches and it's um, the parents who are going to be seeing the kids the most. So if you can educate any of them on either stuff, it's you're around in the circle nearly. Yeah, and I guess they can um, they can keep the, the kids on track as well. And yeah, they find complicated. that interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. if you, you chat to most sort of youth coaches, I think the trick that they always find is having that parents meeting almost and saying, well, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. You know, just so keep them involved, keep them invested i guess yeah yeah 100 percent. even for that as well like if if you if you show a kid their test results and you're seeing reds in the first week and then after eight weeks some of them are green and some of them are orange they're going to buy into it straight away yeah you don't know where you're coming from if you don't know where you've been or you don't know where you're going i suppose if you don't know where you've been that's mm. the test very true um you've obviously worked across a lot of sports so uh i was interested sort of what do you think makes a good sports person i haven't said athlete because i think that's you know yeah sort of pigeonholed it but is there any sort of common traits characteristics abilities yeah. that you've seen um good question never really thought about it to be honest um like what i see massively in rugby that i don't see in the ga or that i didn't see in the ga when i was there working with them um would have been a massive focus on leader groups okay um so with the cookies, for example, I think we've got a group of four or five players who that basically I collect data from. After every session, they'll throw their RPs in. Um, I'll log it over the weeks. But if any issues arise in the club, they'll throw it in and then they basically get me to sort it for them, essentially. Right. Um, so it could be anything like training is going on too long, intensity needs to go up, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is, whatever issue it is, I'm kind of like the mediator between the two groups, nearly between the coaches and myself. And the players um it's funny like there's leadership means it's so broad yeah. like it's very hard to put a put a name to anything or a trait anything like our captain for example he was captain captain young monsters captain of the irish clubs he's a man that literally just demands respect mm. like he's six foot four six foot five probably about eight to ten percent body fat moves phenomenally well is strong as an ox and he just goes out and leads by example by the way he lives his life he's a personal trainer so he's in great nick um then you've got other lads who are really quiet don't like talking to the group but will do every single thing right um and that's something that you kind of have to admire as well mm. so i guess yeah leadership qualities are probably a, a massive thing to sort of look out for and it's, i guess it's uh, difficult to pick those up at you know when they're 12 or 13 years of age but well, it's, it, I guess it's a bonus of being involved with them through a system that you get to see them grow. It's, it's like the more years you spend with a group, the more the more you're going to be able to invest time into them. The more time you invest, if you're if you're promoting the right thing, like um, we do, I do something with the school and with the with your monsters, where after every game or after every training session, they have to bank a certain amount of recovery points. Mm -hmm. um, and if stuff like that is being nailed into them every single opportunity after every single training session and they keep hearing it hearing it hearing it eventually something is going to stick uh, so yeah I suppose it, pick your big rocks and then just try hammer them home really as much as you can and like the beauty of working with kids at that age group is they're sponges they will literally learn and take in information so easy so quick so it's real easy to mold them into whatever way of training that you want them to train um, like I suppose you're never going to get a 16 year old uh, if you see him in the gym during his own time 90% of the time he's either doing a bench press or he's doing oh. bicep, bicep curl <laughs> so no, you'll never see that in any of the programs that uh, that they do with me supervised sessions uh, yeah, you can't put beach weights down you know you never you never know what, what might help um, <laughs> well, <how> right. <laughs> 
Say again? You'll never know what holiday is coming up. <laughs> Very true. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll push on then to sort of uh, your work around AIL and then up to international rugby as well. Um, again, obviously you're involved with, with Young Munster and with the RFU clubs team. Um, I think you spoke to a little bit there about, uh, you know, how typically the guys that you're getting up to the, the clubs team are have probably have a very good training age or pretty robust already and um like do you sort of is there anything that you're you're sort of screening for looking for any red flags or anything that you know you might need to just work on immediately because i guess they're they're going to come up to you they're already probably you know strong enough quick enough agile enough to play the game obviously um and it you know from what you've said maybe it's not too much of a leap up to that sort of IRFU clubs team but is there anything I guess that you, you're, you're sort of looking for to sort of fix in a, um, in it's funny like AIL is so crazy it's it's so intense at times like you know that there's a possibility that on a Saturday that you're going to be coming up um, facing a team that might be stacked with provincial players in the academy system and you might have a prop that only made one training session that week Um not to be picking on props around, but <laughs> like, out of 10 it is then. Um, yeah, so like a lot of things, a lot of things are unbelievable. Um, but then there's an awful lot of work ons as well. But I remember when I went in at the start, I was like, oh, I'm going to change this, this and this, and things are going to be run so much smoother. And then you just have to get to the stage when you realize that these lads aren't professional rugby players, no matter how much you want them to be there. They just aren't like, Yo, Monsters is a very much working class uh, club. There's, we've got an awful lot of lads labouring. Um, we've got an awful lot of students. It's a fairly relatively young team. Um, but like, you can't expect them to be ripping the hinges off the door if they're just after they're working from seven in the morning till five on a building site. Uh, it just doesn't work. So at the start, I was kind of like, I kind of adopted the strategy of tough shit. You're going to do it. And now it, three years later when you get to know them more and they're like, they start trusting you more. Um, and like, if you show them that you care, they'll buy into what you're trying to do straight away. And if some, one of the players comes up to me and he goes, geez, I'm wrecked from work today. I'll go, we'll cut, we'll cut you from conditioning or we'll take out some of your main lifts or something like that. Um, like there, there are some, there's some phenomenal athletes in the league. Especially like young much just does have an awful lot of really solid athletes. Um, Training ages are unbelievable, move really well. Probably at the start, what I would have tried doing is um, bring in like a screening process, like a questionnaire that they'd have to uh, fill out pre-training, post-training. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. The time investment that goes into it versus a working class club like Young Munsters, they just don't see the benefit of it. They don't understand why they're doing it. Or to be honest, they probably just don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. so probably year one I was trying to put a massive emphasis on it and then I just realised that some things just do not work no matter how much you want <laughs> um, so the only way I track load really is by doing SRPs okay. um, bang your RP onto me after training session in the leader group uh, and then I'll log that uh, for the week for the month coming up to games um, yeah that's about it really um, it sounds like as well that you sort of built a good, um, I guess, a, an athlete coach relationship there that they they know that they can come up and sort of chat to you if they're they're feeling down. Do you, how important is that? Do you think? Yeah, it's so important. Like I make I try to make sure that I talk to at least everyone in the week. It's near impossible to get around to everyone in a training session, but I'll make a fair whack at it. Like training might start at seven p.m. and even I'll be there at six because normally there's a group of lads who some teachers there, some office workers, and they'll be in the gym doing their own, um, their own individual stuff, more than likely bench pressing or white side curls as we went. <laughs> uh, go in and have a chat with them, have the crack. They'll tell you how they're feeling. Um, look, working with AIL teams and working with teens for a period of time, like, you're, like this is my third, fourth season with them, you know the lads that need to look out for straight away. Um, like your fast twitch players, they're the ones that you're most worried about because um, their tolerate to, to load is just it's a different level and then like your players who just aren't robust they're the ones that you worry about they're the ones that you go how are you feeling today um, did you eat did you have a good night's sleep did you drink much water today and trying to basically just 
hammer home that they need to be doing this stuff as extras. Mm-hmm. Um, and then knowing the right time when to dose them up on condition as well is probably important. Mm. So you, you've mentioned uh, being robust there. So what does that mean for you? Or what do you look for? Um, well, how they're moving, first of all, their injury history, their likelihood of getting injured again, uh, how much time they're spending on the physio table, uh, how much work they're putting in on the recovery side of things, um, and what do their lifts look like, how rounded they are as an athlete. Um, yeah, I suppose just investment into everything, really, because like, there, there are some athletes there that if they put that extra 5%, five, five, 10% in, they could go unbelievably far, unbelievably far, sorry. Um, but like, no matter how much uh, potential you see in them, they probably just don't see it. And they're, you know, they're probably going like, Jesus, this fella is just not letting up. But like, you just <laughs> want them, you just want them to do really well, even if they can't see it for themselves. You know what mm. kind of way? Yeah. Um, yeah. So being robust, we've been spending an awful lot of time doing mobility work in the gym. And uh, as part of every single pitch warm up session, there's a mobility block in it as well. Um, we spend an awful lot of time doing uh, carries like uh, piggybacks, far, uh, farmer's carries in the gym, uh, fireman's carries, bridle carries up in front. Um, and then just a lot of time wrestling and sprinting. That's that's pretty much taking the boxes for, for everyone that you need in rugby. Mm. Um, I think it's, it's interesting around that sort of topic of robustness and like your, I guess, the the specificity of that towards the game that you're playing um and i know obviously you spoke of the sort of the data you try to collect and the test and that kind of thing that you do and but i also think like coach and i is very important there as well and um i'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on that because i think you know i i would definitely value working with youth players um as a brilliant way to develop your coach and i especially like you're saying around that that age of puberty and phv and that kind of thing you can very quickly, very easily sort of learn how to spot just the tiniest of, you know, adaptations or, or asymmetries or anything that it might be. So, um, which I think is, is a, a great thing for maybe students coming out of college because it's, you know, you're, you're very much invested in the, the academic side and, and what the papers say and what the researchers say. But I think coming out and working in sort of youth sports definitely from a, a college into practice point of view um, really, really helps with that sort of coaching eye aspect. I probably noticed that the most when um, the Tipperary Academy system started really picking up speed. Um, we started taking in maybe four or five interns for the program every single season. And they might be third year or fourth year in, in college. And you're going like, you need to start looking out for certain signs when they're doing exercises. So, if their knees are buckling in, what does that mean when they're squatting? Uh, when they're landing and it's really loud, what should you be telling them to look for? Um, like the, the one thing that I noticed, which is like nearly constructive criticism for the students coming out and into a program who hadn't coached, they're kind of just, they're standing there. They're not really invested into it as much as they possibly should be. Like when you're coaching, it's nearly like you're putting on a show. Obviously it's not a showmanship. Um, but like it's not an over the top but you need to bring energy to everything that you're doing especially in coaching because if you start the session off as the snc and you're kind of like going jesus i got woke up at 6 a.m today and i worked until five and blah 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 and life is shit or whatever like the energy is going to drop straight away and if you're the very first coach that they see when you walk in whether that be gym or pitch and you're kind of moping around the place with no energy that's going to dictate the session mm-hmm. i 100 percent believe in that um, but on the coaching side of things, it's literally just hours and hours in the, in the bank. That's all it is. Get in, start coaching in the gym, uh, go do your internships, all that kind of stuff. But it's just hours. Look, no one to look out for certain things. And it's just hours in the, in the bank. That's all. That's the only way I can put it. Yeah. I think Des Ryan makes a very good point um, a couple of times now of, you know, it's, I guess when you're coming out of college, a lot of people sort of just want to work in that high performance environment. And I definitely was one of those myself, but like there's SNC jobs all over the place. It might be like your local, you know, division 29 hurling team or something, but that's still a, an SNC job. That's still you being able to develop your coach. And I, and I'd absolutely, you know, if there's, there's youth uh, coaching going, going on offer there, I'd absolutely advise sort of, 
you know, new graduates to go out and do it. Take when, that. when I started college in first year, I got a job as a lifeguard in the local life center. Um, then I got roped into doing swim teaching. Very <laughs> nothing about the time, to be honest. Uh, got the qualification through college. Um, and then ever since first year, I was, I was coach on the gym floor then as well, trying to break away from it, from the swim side of things, from your lifeguard swim teaching where it's enjoyable, it's good crack, but it's not where you really want to end up or want to be. So managed to make the split away from that side of things. But swim swim teaching was an unbelievable ground in the coaching. Unbelievable. Being able to spot flaws and their, their way of teaching the Irish swim or whatever it was called, swim teaching, um, their whole part, whole process, it's perfect. Like, it's perfect yeah. for the majority of coaching that goes on uh, on the pitch or in the gym as well. And you can even find it's it's it is crazy that you can find a transference from something as you know like swimming into rugby like it all coaching is coaching as as long as you're you're at it you're doing well I think um okay uh around sort of your sort of I think you've spoken about the robustness and that kind of thing um I'd be interested to jump into the topic of like injury resilience and maybe prehab or rehab or anything that you try to do so um if you could give us like a general view of maybe how you might manage a player's return to play, say like you, you, you have those lads who maybe we won't go, you know, broken leg or anything, maybe just like ankle sprain or something. Sort yeah, of. It, it, it's a pretty decent uh, return to play program that we run in your monsters at the minute. Um, normally what happens is get into playing on a Saturday. Uh, they'll go see the physio on a Monday, which would be our first session of the week. Uh, the physio will do a diagnostic diagnosis on whatever the injury is he'll tell me what he can can't do or give me certain guidelines that i need to be aiming for so normally what we'll do is if they're coming back from a hamstring injury let's just say or a twisted ankle uh are they stable on the ankle can they get up the gears from 50 percent straight line 60 70 80 90 um if they feel pain cap it straight away very first run session that i do i normally um Try get them up the gears. Try get them up to about seventy percent with maybe very limited reps in the tank, very very uh, low meters. So they might only be going out as far as the twenty-two, just doing fall and starts and kind of build ups going into um, your marches, your steps, your skips uh, from the dead ball line to the try line. They might load onto that injured leg, so get the body weight over the sh- um, over their knee, put weight through it, and then drive out with good technique. Um, and it's kind of like just taking the boxes really like mm-hmm. um, get them up to 90-95% doing straight line if they can do that they're pretty much on the on the road to recovery so what we normally do then is we'll give them um, a deceleration window so at the start the deceleration window might be 10 meters you might bring it down to 5 and then you might make it a real abrupt and aggressive stop so can they get up the gears really aggressively and really quickly can they stop as aggressively uh, are they stable when they stop? What's their landing like when they do any jump uh, progressions or going over hurdles or anything like that? Um, and then it's like, can they do a change of direction? Can you introduce them into certain parts of the training session? Um, when they aren't doing, say if it's certain contact um, part of the training and they're not confident going back into it, uh, what can we get them doing that's going to help them uh, get back onto the pitch quicker? Like we had a player... Um, he's a center or a winger phenomenal athlete strong real strong real powerful really powerful athlete um, but he has the worst injury record I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he dislocated his hip he's broken his ankle dislocated his ankle broken bones in his hand like Christ. it's nearly like when you see this fella coming or if he gets through a, a match of 80 minutes in the AL, you're nearly like going thank you <laughs> <laughs> but like of all the players that uh that i've had um i've probably seen him the most and he, he could nearly do this return to play stuff himself <laughs> yeah 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 but it's funny like as i said earlier people don't know what you know until they know how much you care like when you get these lads coming to you and they're injured and then you get them back onto the field that's when you get your buy-in. When you mm-hmm. when you invest all this time making sure that they're okay. How were you after last night's session? Are you sore? Um, what was your RP for that? Um, the buy-in becomes very very easy and it's very effective. Mm. It's, it's, it's minutes of the tank with people and just can't beat that when you're trying to build connections. Like, 
Mm. As you mentioned, you obviously have the, the physiotherapy support and obviously yourself and the coaches and that kind of thing, but um, you can definitely help out with the, the physical side of it. There's, a, there's an awful lot that we can do there. Um, but unfortunately, we're not all trained, you know, psychologists, sports psychologists either. But it's almost a role that you're kind of put into when you're looking after someone's, someone's yeah. rehab. So yeah. is that, you know, how important is that? And, and what do you kind of try to, to look after? To be honest, just go and chat to them, see how they're feeling. Like, yeah. the worst place to be uh, on the rugby field is on the sidelines. Yeah. Like, when you're not when you're not tra- taking part in training, you're not having the crack with the lads in the dressing room after, or the lads aren't taking the piss out of you, especially in your monsters, which is <laughs> like, driven on taking the piss out of people. Um, yeah, like, it's, it is a really tough place to be, and they're probably seeing, they're probably seeing too much of the wrong coach. Like, no one wants to be stuck with the S&C coach. Yeah, the yeah. Or, like, they want to be out there playing ball, so yeah, just try not be a dick, really. To be honest, like um, try be a try be a decent person. See how they're feeling, uh, not just as an athlete, but as a person as well, which is really important. Uh, yeah, and just do the best into it because you're going to be seeing an awful lot of the person as the weeks go by. Mm. Um, have you seen maybe not necessarily with with your own team or anything like that, but obviously the the game has kind of evolved over the last you know five ten years. I think it's it's becoming an awful lot more physical and we have a lot more data around the fact as well um so you know are you seeing an awful lot more injuries or you know how are you sort of ensuring that your players at, at you know at any team are sort of being able to keep up with the demands of the game and, and stay injury resilient what i noticed uh, this year um was that our contact injuries went went through the roof okay. the only real injuries that we picked up last year uh, were contact injuries I think our soft tissue injury record is really really decent for for what we have at the minute um, but I put that solely down to to COVID and uh, not being able to do as much contact prep with the lads not as much wrestling not as much bag work because obviously bags were weren't allowed in training and stuff and then then they're going into matches and they're absolutely hammering each other and they're picking up injuries and it's, it, it honestly was probably this season was probably the toughest season I put down as an SNC coach for the simple fact that probably had what three preseasons with all the start stop play um, and then players getting injured through contact, which you which you knew was going to happen anyway, which is probably the most frustrating part. But there's nothing that you could do. Mm-hmm. Dead legs went went up through the roof, which I'd never seen before in any of the teams I've been with. But it makes sense. Um, yeah, to be honest, soft tissue isn't really something that we're overly worried about in the club. Um, obviously, you're one or two players who you would earmark who you might pull from condition early or you might change their condition in comparison to the majority. Um, but yeah, like I'm fortunate enough to be with them for three or four years now, so I know the lads that you need to worry about. Um, and then like for players who are injured and they're trying to come back into training that you're trying to mind them as much as you can, uh, pull them from trails that they shouldn't be in or maybe saying to the coach is going, you can only get 40 minutes out of this player today, maximum. And then in fairness to the lads, uh, Carol Prendergast and Jar Sla, very good about it. Um, they know that they, they know that 40 minutes is better than being out for another extended period of time. So they are good about it, to be fair. Mm. It sounds like you're, you're very more, it's more so like player focused, you know, injury resilience kind of work and you, you know what their history is like and what you know what maybe they're capable of doing what they should be doing would you be the type of person who would kind of look at say you know along the lines of the the, the new IRFU um what's it called the Irish study or any you know looking at trends for say particular positions or levels or that kind of thing um yeah I actually will I collect the data for the Irish uh, program last year and I actually sat on one of the Irish projects on Tuesday evening um, on Patrick Dolan's uh, thing that he's trying to generate a warm-up plan for AIL coaches um, and I think it's kind of geared more towards uh, lower divisions that the club might not be able to afford an SNC coach or whatever situation it might be. Um, in regards to players who are, or sorry, positional demands affecting injury, is it? Yeah. You know what you're going to be looking at, really, isn't it? It's going to be um, your backs are looking at high speed meters. So the likelihood of being at a muscular injury is probably higher. Uh, your centers are going to come into an awful lot of collisions. So it's going to be a contact injury. And then your forwards are just 
going to be running into stuff really aggressively, <laughs> really hard. So, like, and what we see an awful lot is um, is neck issues for our front row. Um, so it might be stiffness after games. Don't really see any lower limb issues. Second rows are pretty robust anyway. Flankers are are your athletes in the team. They're going to pick up your contact injuries if they're going to see it. Uh, the majority of injuries that we see being picked up is uh, our AC injuries, which come through contact. Because mm. um, the collisions that they do go into, they're, some of the hits in the AIL, are, they're sick, like, absolutely sick. So, and probably it's not at the highest standard, it's not professional, so tackle tech is probably an issue as well. But yeah, to be honest, they're, they are robust enough. Based on positional demands, you pretty much know what, it, what injuries are going to be coming and when they come. Mm. And in the six or seven years that you've been involved at the, the AIL team, have you seen maybe any major changes to the game itself? Like, is it a lot more? Obviously, there's real changes in that kind, but is yeah. there any physicality yeah. changes? Uh, probably most of more last year um, was probably the first time, maybe the way we ch- we kind of tried changing the way that we played the game, uh, how, the, how the coaches want them to be conditioned for that game, uh, which is massively important because I think in my first year, there was no chat about that. Um, probably work with a new SSC coach at the time there they probably didn't know what to what they were expecting out of it um what relationship that you had back then versus what you had now probably channels of communication are way more open uh kind of it's an interesting one because you see that the nines getting through more rocks now and hitting ball really really fast um and the ball is going to be moving way faster next season again so they're going to have to be more robust, more resilient, and more high-speed meters. That's pretty much what it's looking at. Um, like the days of having slow ball now, in, especially in Tom Clifford Park, which we probably, which we probably thrived on previously, which probably isn't going to happen anymore. Uh, props are probably... We're lucky you now this year we've got a really decent front row. Um, like we probably have two, three props who can play your 80 minutes comfortably which you don't really see in the AL anymore, even in the program, you never see a prop. Maybe Andrew Porter at the minute is probably the only one who's clocking 80 minutes every week. Um, but yeah, I think that they're going to, props probably are more mobile than what they've ever been previously. Um, and they're a lot more athletic. They, they move an awful lot better, especially when you're like, for the Irish clubs, for example, like, the standard of athlete in there was something like the AIL is good. Irish clubs was unbelievable for such a small step up. You're getting, you're getting the cream of the crop essentially. Um, and uh, there was a real athletic, decent athletic base in the, in, in the squad. So it was lucky. Mm. How was that experience going to, going to cross to, to Scotland? And, and that was brilliant. It's brilliant. Just <laughs> 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 trying to think of some of the memories there. Um, no, it was brilliant, honestly. Um, getting to live the life of a pro S and C coach is yeah. it's the dream, really. It's the reason you go to college for all that length of time. Um, and plus, like the backroom team that we had then was was unbelievable. It was, it was brilliant because it was really comfortable. Uh, the old Munster S and C coach was the head coach of the Irish clubs. Uh, our video analyst was the Cookies video analyst as well. Um, and then Mark Hamilton was just the best he's unbelievable yeah he's the turn your uh, manager as well and if you wanted anything done it was done like that <laughs> and he was just great crack and he kind of just went that extra mile to get things sorted for you or even equipment laid out or it was and small little details you just had it down to a t and um, and then when you know the stuff isn't organized you don't worry about it and oh, i was brilliant it was it was an unbelievable couple of months uh very unfortunate i got cancelled this year but yeah um Apparently we're done for the next two seasons anyway, so hopefully I'll have that to look forward to then, yeah. Very good, very good. Um, look, my last question sort of was around where do you sort of see yourself going and have you any sort of aims? And obviously you've mentioned the, the enjoyment of international rugby and that kind of thing. So is that something that you're looking to spend more time in? Uh, yeah, 100%. Um, I kind of, I'd probably have to make a decision here in a short time. I'm not getting any younger, really, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I want to, I, I know exactly what I want. Um, just have to reverse engineer it now. Uh, I want to end up in an academy, uh, in a provincial academy in rugby. Um, obviously, the couple of years I've like, built up experience wise will stand to me, but I still need to get my UKSCA, which is probably a limiting factor. Um, but obviously, with COVID coming in, 
not ideal, <laughs> not ideal time to try and get this done over the line. Um, but yeah, get UKSCA done. Hopefully, get into a, a provincial academy in the next hopefully year or two. I said the goal of being thirty and being in uh, an academy didn't hit it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that these things already take a year or two extra. Um, so yeah, hopefully get into a provincial academy in the next while, um, and then possibly look at PhD down the line. Definitely, definitely. No, I was I was in the exact same boat as the, the UKSEA stuff that I had booked in for the the one up in Belfast, and then I think the day before the restrictions got announced, so I was just like, but yeah, hopefully next year I'm in the exact same boat. So um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, look, uh, Rob, it's been brilliant having you on. So thank you very much. Um, all the best in, in the future. And I hope the rest of you know the lockdown treats you well and we can get back to the pitch soon. Yeah, 100%. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.